to Wayland Red Talks, a forum of inspiration and information for the Wayland community. We're delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mickey Hebel from the class of 1987. Dr. Hebel earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Smith College and pursued a PhD from Dartmouth College. She joined the faculty at Rice University in 1998 and currently serves as the Martha and Henry Malcolm Lovett Professor of Psychology with a joint appointment in the Jones School. Mickey's research focuses on workplace discrimination and the ways both individuals and organizations can remediate such discrimination and successfully manage diversity. She has approximately 200 publications and has earned 21 teaching awards, including the most prestigious national award called the Cherry Award. She is also the recipient of research grants from the NSF and the NIH and several gender-related research awards. In 2014, she was honored with the Academy of Management's SAGE Award for a lifetime achievement in research advancing the knowledge of gender and diversity in organizations. She has also participated in interviews in the mass media as a subject matter expert. Mickey was recognized in 2017 for her outstanding achievements with the Wayland Academy Alumni Achievement Award. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Mickey Hebel. Hi, Wayland students and larger Wayland community. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, I graduated from Wayland Academy in 1987. I spent both my junior and senior years there as a day student. I want to give a big shout out to some of the people that were there at the time who really helped make the experience a good one for me. And I have no doubt whatsoever that going to Wayland helped influence and positively shape the trajectory of my life in such amazing ways. So. I feel very fortunate to have gone there and it's always a pleasure to speak with students and to just revisit the beautiful campus. Um, this is where I am today. So after leaving Wayland, I did my bachelor's degree at Smith College in Massachusetts and then went to Dartmouth in um, New Hampshire. And then I did something a little bit antithetical to most people in Wisconsin. Instead of staying in the cold, I went for the heat. And so I've been down at Rice University uh, for the last 22 years, and I've really loved my time down here. It's a beautiful campus, as you can see, and I teach um, undergraduates. I train PhD students, and I teach executive MBAs at Rice University. Now, when I was at Wayland, and I thought about psychology, the only thing I thought you did as a psychologist was you counseled people. And that is a noble thing. And during this time, I think uh, each one of us could use counselors. This is a crazy time. I think we've seen mental health uh, uh, needs increase and each of us may be feeling the sociopolitical stress or stress from the pandemic or from any variety of other things that we are experiencing in today's US society. So what I would say to you is um, this is a noble cause. I hope that some of you go into this, but for others, you might say, well, is there anything else you do with a psychology major? And that's really the point of my talk today is I want to share with you and help you discover that there are other things you can do with a psychology major. And so the title is called Discovering Social and IO Psychology. Now, both of these areas um, are where it, are the intersection of where I study. Social psychology is the study of the way people think about, influence, and interact with others. An industrial organization is taking those principles and applying them to the workplace. So it's the study of human behavior in organizations and the workplace. I want to give you some idea about the sorts of things that social and IO psychologists study. And again, many of these are so relevant to what we are experiencing today as a society. 
So we study attitudes. We ask questions like, how do people feel about wearing masks? Why do some feel so positively and others feel so negatively? Um, why do we care about self-presentation so much? Um, this is Cindy Jackson. She's 24 years old on the left before any cosmetic surgeries. And here she is at 59 where she's had 52 cosmetic treatments and surgeries. And she is in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the most number of surgeries, although she's about to be passed. We also study persuasion and we ask, why is it that the dairy section is always in the back of the grocery stores? What do we need when we go to the grocery stores? Most of us always need something in the dairy section, milk, eggs, yogurt, butter. And so why is it so far away? What are grocery stores trying to do to us? We can also ask, why do grocery stores always bundle items? So it's 10 for 10. And yet, when we look at the fine print, we see that each item we buy is one. So if we really just want three, we could get three for $3. So why is it 10 for 10? We, can, we look at relationships. We ask who gets together, who stays together. We look at workplace relationships as well. We look at social interactions in general, and one of the things we're looking at now um, is how techno technology and social media is influencing our interactions and our relationships. And I think this is captured extremely well in a photo montage that was presented recently in The Atlantic and what it was called as the isolation effects of cell phones and of um, iPads as well. So here you see what kids are doing with the majority of their time. And you might ask, what is this doing to kids' activity levels, to kids' brains, and to their ability to engage in social interactions? And this isn't just between kids, it's between parents and children, and it's between uh, couples. One of the biggest um, needs that social uh, individuals need is the need to belong. So we call it social animals and social animals crave belongingness. We want to be, have social support. And in fact, one of the things we know is that if you don't have it and if you're lonely, it's a greater predictor of death um, over smoking or heart disease. And we might ask, why is loneliness so bad? Why is it so harmful? We might also look at aggression and say, who commits crimes? Should guns be so readily available? And in Texas, if you can believe it, we have a sword, uh, open carry sword uh, law that's now been in effect for one year, or actually two years now. Um, is this maybe just going a little far? We also can look at more generally violence in the work. Not surprisingly, it's increased. Is actor shooter training our new reality? We look at conformity and we say, thank goodness um, that many people conform to a lot of different societal norms. Thank goodness in this case that we all drive the same way. But we can also think about how choosing not to conform can literally save your life. As social and IO psychologists, we look at um, the bystander effect and we say, why do some people walk by others who are in such great need? And that's particularly the case when we look at happiness and we see that focusing on and helping others is one of the biggest predictors of happiness. Now, if you're interested in social psychology or in IO psychology, you can look at popular um, books because there are so many that are out on the market. I think uh, Malcolm Gladwell was the first to really showcase our fields. And since then, many authors have released popular press books about social psychology. So you can think about quiet, maybe you've heard about mindset, uh, blind spot, obedience to authority. Um, please check out some of these if I've piqued your interest at all. My bigger question to you is, what do you notice when you look at human behavior? Uh, what social problems interest you? What do you think are the social behaviors that need desperate attention right now? 
And this is what I conduct my own research on. I would call myself a social justice researcher and I'm particularly interested in prejudice. So I ask why do people have prejudices and biases? And I look at discrimination and ask why do people discriminate and how can we reduce discrimination? Some of my work looks at gender um, biases in particular, and one of the most shocking things I think is when we think of the United States and we rank countries on um, equity, on gender equity. The World Economic Forum has done just this. Out of 153 countries, the US ranks a dismal 53rd. And you might say, why is that? And part of the reason is the lack of family-friendly policies and paid leave. So women do not have paid maternity leave. And that is something that so many other developed and developing countries have. We also see women just aren't making it to the top. So there are more CEOs named John or David than all female CEOs in the S&P 1500. In my own research, I look at pregnancy discrimination. Um, these are clearly graduate students who are wearing pregnancy prosthetics because I like to say nobody that's that pregnant smiles that big. I also look at size bias. So this is somebody wearing a 22, size 22 prosthetic. Um, and here she is in her um, regular size. I look at discrimination based on religion. So here's somebody who is not, and here's somebody who is wearing a hijab. And what are the different reactions that they get and the strategies they can use to reduce discrimination? I also do research on within group discrimination. So it's not just about men versus women or blacks versus whites. But if we look within blacks, is there discrimination, more discrimination towards certain blacks than others? And what we see is those who are higher in stereotypicality, so the first and third pictures, face more discrimination than the second and fourth. Now, my research also focuses on strategies to reduce this discrimination. And these strategies focus on what targets can do. So if you're the target of discrimination, what specific things can you do? What if you're an ally? How can you help and make a difference in the life of somebody who's experiencing discrimination? And finally, what can organizations do? So what can they adopt to reduce the discrimination? I again return to getting you to think about what do you think is most important? What do you notice when you look at human behavior? What social problems interest you? And what do you think needs desperate attention? I want to end with a quote by a woman that I so greatly respect and I think um, was just a, a trendsetter for so many of us doing gender research. If you want to be a true professional, you will do something outside of yourself, something to repair tears in your community, something to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you. That's what I think a meaningful life is, living not for oneself, but for one's community. And with that, I hope I have inspired at least one social or IO psychologist, and I hope that I have inspired you to do something that is related to a cause that's near and dear to your heart. Thank you.